I remember places, the plantations that from my father's family and and my mother's big piece of property that is now being very well used. Cherry Point was a place to go swimming, wading, boating, fishing. One of the areas was called Splinterville. That's how bad it was. So when we were driving into Havelock, my wife started crying, and my two daughters started crying. But we had a great time here at Cherry Point. We found out after we got here, there was a heck of a lot to do here. Cherry Point was a good assignment, as I say. It's... I'm very proud that Cherry Point was part of my background. From its humble beginnings as a swampy grass strip to its modern form as the largest Marine Corps Air Station in the eastern United States, this is the story of Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point. The land that Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point now occupies has been in use for thousands of years before the first Marine aircraft landed in 1945. What is now strategically valuable land for the Marine Corps was once equally valuable for the generations of American Indians and European settlers. Uh, there was a, a huge Native American population here. The ones that lived locally right here that we still find artifacts for was, was a tribe called the Nusiox, which the, from which the Noose River takes its name. But there's one location on Cherry Point that we know for certain that there was an Indian village for 700 years. And some of the artifacts that have been found by archaeological research on Cherry Point go back 3,000 years. Following the Native American inhabitants, early settlers from around the world began to migrate here enticed by the rich farming opportunities and the possibility of freedom in a new land. The first family that I can prove that was here were, were the Hancock family that, that we have a map that shows they had a working plantation on Hancock Creek that bears their name, one of the boundaries for the base in 1707. Uh, William Hancock's cousin, John Slocum, uh, was here at the same time. Slocum Creek is named for him. They both came in the same wave of migration. A little known fact from the Civil War ties the land that the air station sits on to the fighting nature of the Marine Corps itself. Early in the Civil War, uh, the, the Secretary of the Navy, Federal Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, made a wish list of ports that he wanted to take. Number three on the list was Newburn, North Carolina. Newburn was an incredible port at the time. And in March of 1862, a fleet of 60 Union ships landed at the mouth of Slocum Creek, right near where the Cherry Point Officers Club is now, and uh, unloaded 15,000 Union soldiers. Uh, and then marched to New Bern, and on March 14, 1862, fought the Battle of New Bern, and then used that as a base of operations to take um, the fort at Fort Macon. And pretty much eastern North Carolina was uh, under Union control for the rest of the war. Uh, this section of eastern North Carolina from Beaufort to New Bern was under their control, but it all started right at where Cherry Point is today. The thing I find most amazing about the whole thing is that they did an amphibious landing there. There's illustrations from Harper's Weekly that show from the Union soldiers jumping out in what was an amphibious assault on land that would one day be occupied by the outfit famous for amphibious assaults, the United States Marine Corps. Though the Civil War foreshadowed the eventual use of this land, it had a devastating effect on those who lived here at the time. After the Civil War and after the Naval Stores uh, business collapsed and so many people left, this was a very isolated and uh, uninhabited place. I mean, there were still families here, but there, were a lot, there was a whole lot of nothing. The devastation caused by the war and the effects of the Reconstruction plunged much of the South into an immediate economic depression that was not a short-lived problem. The local area was deeply affected by the economic hard times. Uh, there was a huge out-migration from this area, and a lot of the earliest settlers, whose names we know from the colonial period, just moved away. They went somewhere else to seek better opportunity because this end of the county has never been real good for farming. It grows a heck of a pine tree and that's what they made their living off of was tapping the, the sap of the pine trees. So as far as continuity of uh, uh, you know long families from the 1700s, there's not because so many of them left. Mother's father was from Holland and he came to the United States, decided that they would go down to Carolina 
And so they went down. And all except my great grandfather didn't like it. They, it was too hot, it was too humid, there were too many mosquitoes, it was too much, you know, humidity. They couldn't stand it. And so he bought all the acreage. And the family would come down from Chicago in the summertime and kind of camp there and while they were building a home. And that's how my family got started, what is now Cherry Point Marine Base. Hugh Trader gave credit to any and all that kept some people basically from starving. Even as the financial backbone of the area collapsed, the residents that stayed felt that their property was worth much more than monetary valuation. Cherry Point, my first recollection was a place to go swimming, wading, boating, fishing. And people who lived in Philadelphia and people who lived in New York City absolutely loved it and they would come down here on the train. We've seen ads that said, you know, 24 hours by train from New York City to Havelock Station. And they would come here because they could hunt and they could fish and there was some pretty good moonshine whiskey down here and they could get away from it all. And for example, Babe Ruth, who was a star who was in the limelight all the time, who was a, you know, the greatest baseball player in history, could come to Havelock, North Carolina and completely let his hair down and be treated like a normal human being. And there were a lot of people that did that. So there was a, a trade, a tourist trade here, of people who wanted to come and hunt and fish, you know, just enjoying the woods here in North Carolina. In 1940, the United States government also saw the possibilities of the wide open lands of eastern North Carolina. There was a young congressman from Newburn named Graham Barden, who was a really, really good politician, a very smart guy. And from everything that I've read about, and he advocated Eastern North Carolina for the location of those because of the fact that there was a lot of open land here. And also because he had really, really good connections in Washington. But what a lot of people don't know is that Cherry Point was actually supposed to be on the other side of the river at what's called Wilkinson Point. Um, it, uh, the, at the very last minute, it was moved over to where it is now because they couldn't figure out a way to connect Camp Lejeune and Cherry Point with the railroad. The incoming air station was welcome to the area because of the jobs that came with it. The coming of the Marine Corps Air Station, uh, I'm sure for most people, was, a, was considered to be a great blessing. Uh, a lot of people were hired, uh, had jobs, had incomes they would have never had before. But as soon as the paint was dry on the runway in 1942, the first planes began uh, to land here. The first one was a Grumman Duck. The base commander landed um, in 1942, and then immediately after that, uh, the Mitchell bombers came in. Uh, the base was under construction and had been under construction for a number of months when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. And that just put this place into overdrive. One of the things a lot of people don't know is that this was actually a medium bomber base to begin with. The uh, Mitchell bombers were here uh, before, before anything else, like the Corsairs and things of that sort. Some of those Mitchell bombers were used to do anti-submarine warfare off the North Carolina coast because the Nazi U-boats were very active there. Once inside the main gate, the view was impressive. The air station was a self-contained city and a beehive of activity. There were people by the thousands, aircraft by the hundreds, and ongoing construction everywhere. Well, Cherry Point at that time was buzzing because they had a lot of training going on. Corsairs, SB2Cs, there was also, at that time, the A&R building was booming and they say that they could uh, have a crash and put it back together and fly it again in a month's time, which they did many times. Along with other famous aircraft instrumental in the winning of the war, the Grumman F-6F Hellcat spent time on the air station's newly paved runways. The F-6F was formed at Shirt Point in 1944. Yeah, they was formed here at Shirt Point. That's the ones that MacArthur 
requested because those P-61s could not meet the Jap Zero. I would say uh, the Cherry Point was a good assignment, as I say. It's, I uh, had a lot of liberty at Cherry Point. With the sudden population increase of 25,000 people, coinciding with the building of Cherry Point, housing became one of the most significant problems that air station personnel had to face. But housing was a big issue all the way up until the 1960s. Uh, it, it just couldn't be built fast enough to accommodate you know, what was going on here. One of the areas was called Splinterville. That's how bad it was, with wooden houses uh, that we put up during World War II to house uh, people. If you come out the back gate on 101, if you look to the left and the right, there used to be houses out there. Flat tops, they were called. Following the end of World War II, Cherry Point saw a great reduction in its forces. By January of 1946, the air station dropped from 13,000 Marines, women reserves, and civilians to only 6,300. Building aboard the air station, however, did continue through the decade. Along the Noose River, a new officer's club and golf course was constructed. By December of 1949, all planned construction had been completed and a self-contained city stood on its own. Following the air station's involvement in the Korean War, Cherry Point experienced substantial growth. To accommodate the new jet aircraft being introduced into the Marine Corps, refueling capacity increased by 100%. Advances in radar technology created new jobs. A new Navy crash crew facility was built. The operations tower received a complete renovation to include a new runway. And the largest addition by far was four new hangars and administrative buildings. While we had a hangar, um, all of the other buildings that we operated out of, the line shack, the avionics office, all of those buildings were wooden buildings. And uh, the runway was identical to what it is now, which is, which is one of the fant most fantastic runways you know, in the world, I think, because of the way it's laid out. Uh, you've got, uh, if you really need it, you've got uh, an easy 16,000 feet of concrete that you can use uh, operating in and out of Cherry Point. The air station wasn't the only organization undergoing change. Uh, we were the first VMCJ squadron, as I recall, in the Marine Corps to get the F-8U-1P Crusaders. Other aircraft that were arriving at the air station included the Lockheed Martin C-130F Hercules turboprop refueler, later designated the KC-130, and the North American FJ-3 Fury Fighter. By the end of the decade, prop power flight at Cherry Point was virtually a thing of the past. With the transition of aircraft, the attitude of the air station seemed to change as well. I, I, I didn't think Cherry Point was the end of the world. I thought it was one of the best kept secrets in the Marine Corps. Uh, it wasn't long after I'd gotten here, there was a place down in Atlantic Beach called the Pavilion. And, uh, and that was like a gold mine if you wanted to meet the babes, you know. And so, uh, as a matter of fact, I met the girl that later became my wife uh, down at the Pavilion. And, uh, and, and through these two male friends that I in initially mentioned, I met a lot of other people. So I had a great time here at Cherry Point. Great time. The Cold War warmed up in October of 1962 when the Soviet Union began secretly building the ballistic missile installations in Cuba. With the U.S. in need of high-resolution photographs of Cuba, Marines from VMA Q2 took to the skies and captured the needed imagery. Every aircraft, every person, every thing that was could be deployed was deployed uh, on a Sunday and a Monday uh, 50 years ago. When when we were going down to Cuba and the base was down there and we would go down there and, and fly the uh, the fence line down there for for photo recon and it seemed like we'd never get any information 
because somehow they'd know we were coming. So I remember suggesting, can't we fly directly down there? And uh, turns out you can with two drop tanks. You didn't have to go to some base in Florida and then fly out there. You could go out over the airways and, uh, and directly to Cuba. And we, we went down there, we caught them. They didn't know we were coming. We flew the fence line going in there, and uh, they, they got a lot of intelligence that wasn't, that wasn't available. It was, it was a perilous moment in history, and Trey Point can be proud of being a major player in it. Despite the challenges faced by personnel at the Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point during the war in Vietnam, it was a time of expansion and modernization. Aircraft technology also continued to advance during the 60s. New aircraft introduced include the Grumman EA-6A and the McDonnell Douglas F-4J Phantom II. Although the air station and its tenants were expanding and modernizing, the city of Havelock retained its small town charm. There wasn't a whole lot to do if, if you weren't uh, somebody that went to a bar or, or, or that type of thing. Havelock, I tell you there wasn't much at Havelock. What did you do for Liberty? Oh, I tell you, Havelock was grim. <laughs> there were people, when they heard they were coming to Havelock, uh, their face dropped and they were considering resigning. <laughs> for us and from where we came from, it was kind of exciting because there was a Sears store downtown, there was a Belk store downtown, and uh, things that we used to have to drive to the next city when we were kids to get, we could get right here in this little town. So we were really happy. We found out after we got here there was a heck of a lot to do here in the area. I mean, the, 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 the fishing and everything. As far as liberty and things, I wanted to hunt and fish so the beach wasn't very far, fishing off the piers. And, uh, During the 1970s, Cherry Point was home to aircraft that are now considered major milestones in Marine Corps aviation. The F-4 Phantom, which was the, the, the fighter, the Marine Corps fighter, great airplane. Um, then when the A-6 came in, EA-6B, the, and they came in, that was a two-seater pilot and a bombardier navigator. And uh, that was kind of the airplane because it was new in the inventory and, and pilots were learning how to fly it. Uh, later on, of course, the AVA came into the inventory. Uh, different flight characteristics, as you well know, because it would lift right straight up and land. It had roll out and uh, a quick takeoff. So, so uh, those are all really uh, milestones in aviation history for the Marine Corps. Even with the changes to the air station and the modest growth of Havelock, it was still a culture shock for the Marines and their families when they arrived in the area. So when we were driving into Havelock, my wife started crying. Then my two daughters started crying. <laughs> and my wife had said, we left here in 1957, and this place hadn't changed a bit, you know. So you wanted the truth, that was the truth. And we stayed here at Cherry Point, but we had a great time here at Cherry Point. It was a lot different than it is now. There was not near uh, the conveniences that there are now. <coughs> but we made, made do with what we had. But Havelock has grown quite a bit, and it, it, it provided more things for uh, the people to do. The people on base now you have a Walmart, and they have some more, you know, other places to shop. During the 1980s, President Reagan's buildup literally transformed the outdated 70s-era U.S. military into a modern force in readiness that eventually deployed to Saudi Arabia. Part of this is seen in the air station announcing a $16 million program for the aircraft direct refueling system, which would accommodate the Air Force's mammoth C-5 Galaxy transport, as well as provide faster turnaround times for other aircraft. It was also during this time that the runway was changed from 200 feet wide to 400 feet wide, which allowed Cherry Point to be named as an alternate landing site for the shuttle. Second Maw units were active in exercises and operations around the globe during the 1980s, to include those in Lebanon, Cuba, Grenada, Panama, and the Dominic Republic. In 
In August of 1990, the Iraq army invaded Kuwait and the United States reaction was swift and decisive. From early December 1990 to mid-January 1991, more than 12 million pounds of cargo and 28,000 Marines were moved through Cherry Point to Saudi Arabia for operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. The 2nd Marine Aircraft Wing was deployed to the area as well and flew in support of ground operations. Almost as suddenly as the war began, however, it was over, just 43 days after the initial sorties were flown. On September 11th, 2001, the United States was attacked when terrorists flew airliners into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, killing over 3,000 innocent Americans. President George Bush declared a war on terror and Marines from Cherry Point left home again to take the fight to the enemy in a chapter that has not yet been fully written. Throughout the history of Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point, there has been a number of Marines that stood out for action that went above and beyond. Lieutenant Colonel uh, Cushman was the first base commander at Cherry Point. He was sitting here with a huge entourage of five or six Marines to run the base. Um, he retired as a Lieutenant General, um, quite a distinguished military career, but he was the first base commander. He was the guy who landed the, that first aircraft in, uh, in 1942. And um, interestingly enough, his, his son, when he was a lieutenant colonel, was the uh, CEO of BMC J-2 here at Cherry Point flying FAU Crusader jets. His dad was flying that slow-moving prop plane and, uh, and, and his son would later serve here at Cherry Point and um, aircraft would break the sound barrier. Um, anybody who's in the Marine Corps or anybody who's interested in the Marine Corps uh, should read a little bit about uh, Marion Carl and what he and his contemporaries accomplished in, in World War II. As a young second lieutenant, um, he shot down his first plane in the Battle of Midway and then went on to be uh, a hero in Guadalcanal. Uh, he was a real a leader, uh, wound up uh, his career uh, at the end of the war with 18 and a half aerial victories, one of the top aces in the Marine Corps of all times. But then did other things like as, as a test pilot and uh, breaking speed records and distant records. Um, when Chuck Yeager and, and his jet powered aircraft broke the sound barrier um, for the first time, it was Marion Carl's 650 mile an hour a record that he broke. Um, Carl went on to serve in Korea uh, and, and Vietnam, but we know him here locally because he was both the base commander and wing commander uh, at Cherry Point. Pretty um, amazing individual. After World War II, I think in recognition of what uh, Carl had done, they gave him the first uh, jet fighter squadron in the Marine Corps, uh, F-1 Phantoms, right here at Cherry Point. Uh, but Mary and Carl being Mary and Carl, he wasn't satisfied to just have them flying loops around here doing touch and goes. He turned them into, pre into a precision flying team called the Flying Leathernecks and began to do exhibitions all over the country. And he continued that until the Navy made the decision that they were going to take the mission over with a little outfit called the Blue Angels. But what's really interesting about that is when they made that transition, the Blue Angels were flying prop planes. It, it's arguable that uh, the Marine Corps would not have uh, helicopters if it hadn't been for Marion Carl. He was one of the very early advocates of it and was involved in, uh, if selling is the right word, selling the, the helicopter to the Marine Corps as, as, a, as a weapon um, and a, a tool that could be used in combat for, for multiple missions. Uh, but yes, he was, he was uh, you know, the first Marine Corps helicopter pilot. Jack Conger was, uh, was one of those. I'd, I just knew him as one of the dads in the neighborhood. It was later in life that I found out that Conger was an aerial ace in World War II, uh, had 10 victories, uh, probably the uh, most dramatic of which was after having shot down three planes and one uh, combat mission, he was lined up on a fourth a Japanese aircraft when he ran out of ammunition. And I guess, uh, full of adrenaline, he decided that the thing to do would be just to ram the guy. And uh, that caused both his plane and the Japanese plane to crash. 
uh, into the Pacific. But during that battle, there were a lot of uh, naval launches out, and, and Conger was uninjured and picked up by a naval launch, was going to be taken back to a ship, but he insisted on uh, going to rescue the Japanese pilot. Another Marine aviator who would have Cherry Point ties saw, and, and saw action in World War II uh, was a gentleman named Christian Frank Schilt, who wound up being the base commander at Cherry Point. But in 1928, uh, Schilt landed a biplane on a burning Nicaraguan street during, uh, to, to rescue wounded and trapped Marines uh, during, uh, during some fighting there. Um, he landed on a, on a street that was just a few, few feet wider than his aircraft, uh, 400 feet long with a cliff at the end, uh, while being fired upon uh, to, bring out, uh, uh, to bring out wounded Marines and to bring in supplies. And if that wasn't enough, he repeated the feat 10 times over the next few days and flew out 15 or 18 wounded Marines, some of them in critical condition, who would have otherwise died. And for this, for this feat, for this accomplishment, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, he went on uh, to serve you know, in, 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 just with distinction in other wars. He became the first um, general officer to qualify for jets. He, uh, qualified to be a helicopter pilot at age 60 and, uh, and retired as a four-star general. Um, all in all, uh, an absolutely fantastic military career. Um, but his tie here is that he was, the, he was a base, one of the early base commanders of Cherry Point Marine Corps Air Station. Uh, during World War II, then Captain uh, Frank C. Theron was uh, one of the defenders of, of uh, Midway Island and it was attacked by the Japanese and there was a 17 day battle and uh, Theron distinguished himself there. He won a Silver Star, a Distinguished Flying Cross and two Air Medals uh, for, his, for his actions there and uh, he, was, uh, he served as the CEO of Cherry Point in 1960-1962. Probably of, of all of the base commanders who have served at Cherry Point, uh, Fontana is among the most popular with the community and the most well known because he chose to raise his family here, and, and this was, Cherry Point was his home throughout almost all of his career. Fontana was an ace in World War II. He was a, a leader of men, he, uh, but he did something very unique here at Cherry Point. He had all three of the commands over the years. He, had, he was the, command, the commanding general of the base, the commanding general of the 2nd Marine Corps Air Wing, and the um, commander of the uh, aviation depot that's known today as the Fleet Readiness Center East. Through the years, uh, there have been a, a lot of unique and distinguished individuals here. For example, the heavyweight uh, boxing champion Joe Lewis uh, fought exhibition bouts here in World War II. Uh, Ted Williams was a pilot at, at Cherry Point, the famous uh, Boston Red Sox slugger. The then very famous uh, movie actor Tyrone Power uh, was an aviator here and uh, was absolutely a phenomenon to have in the, in the midst of people here in, in New Bern and Havelock and Moorhead City. Um, B. Arthur, who was from the Golden Girls, was a, a woman reserve marine here during World War II. A lot of folks of that caliber that have come through uh, and, uh, and visited the area. In addition to hundreds of thousands of what would you call them, just regular uh, Marines that have come and served from all over the all over the country, so it's not too hard to go anywhere in the United States of America and, and find somebody who uh, you know has served at Cherry Point because there's been so many people that passed through here through the years.